Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Welcome to our service of worship. And if you are a guest with us today, I especially welcome you on behalf of the whole church. And we're glad that you're worshiping uh, with us this morning. I want to ask you to take a moment and find the attendance registration folder on the row where you're sitting and fill it out and pass it down. Pass it back again and take note of who is sitting with you and take the opportunity this morning, sometime before you leave, to get to know those around you if you don't know them already. Also, uh, I ask you to take the the, uh, uh, insert that you have in your bulletin that has the announcements on it and take note of the opportunities for service and for worship and study and other activities in the life of the church and be a part of those and invite a friend to be a part of that with you. This morning, we are talking about, thinking about what to throw away and what to keep. Uh, In the words of the immortal theologian Kenny Rogers in the song, The Gambler, what to throw away, what to keep. In that song, he says, it is the secret to surviving. The Apostle Paul would word that differently, I'm sure, but would say that what we throw away and what we keep is critically important in our lives, in our spiritual lives. And so we'll be thinking about that together. I want to call your attention to the hymn that we're going to start with this morning. It is number 421. And normally this is something Taylor Davis does for us, but I'm going to talk about this hymn for just a moment because I want us to think carefully about it together as we sing. It's called Make Me a Captive Lord. And it is about the paradox that if we are to be truly free, then we are truly free when we are held captive by God's love and God's grace. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. There are several images that the song uses. In the second verse, and this is what I want to point out to you, so you can sing it the way the poet intended, the hymn writer intended, and think about its meaning. It says, My heart is weak and poor until it master find. It has no spring of action sure. It varies with the wind. Now, growing up, I always sang wind with this song, but that's not the image here. The image is the wind. It has no spring of action sure, so it varies with the wind. Um, The image, of course, is the image of a watch or a clock. And what we need is that action, that, that, uh, that spring of action, sure. And it's that that uh, God provides for us. It's in relationship that we find freedom, that we find meaning, and we find purpose. And so that's what the hymn writer is communicating to us. And we'll sing it in just a moment. Before we do that, please stand and take a moment and greet those around you.
Let us pray together. Gracious God, as your spirit dwells within each one of us, may we reflect the light of your love to this world. Empower us to be witnesses to all that gives and nurtures life for all people. Amen. to invite the children to come down to our usual spot for our time together. Come on. see. Okay, I think I've got everything I need for the journey. I could probably have some more treasures with me, but I've got the things that are really important. I just can't do life's journey without it. I've got the word of the Lord, and I've got this lamp, and I've got a really giant sock monkey, and, and that's all I need, and, and this thermos, and that's all I need, and, and this LP of Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. So I've got absolutely everything, but it's, it's feeling a little bit bulky. Hang on, let me consult the Word of the Lord here and see if there's something I need to be doing a little bit differently. Let me see. All right. It says, let's see, John 4, verse 14. Let's see what it has to say there. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. Oh, well, that's cool. That's going to make my journey a little easier. So here, I don't need the thermos. 
All right, so I've got everything I need for the journey now. I've got the word of the Lord. I've got the really big sock monkey. I've got the lamp, and I've got the Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, okay? Uh, Hang on, let me consult the word of the Lord again. Okay, this one says, Psalm 96, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Okay, let me check. Uh, copyright date. Ooh, that's not really a new song anymore. Okay, um, here you go. Uh, I'm going to need that back. It's got Zorba the Greek on there, so just, okay. All right, so I've got everything I need for my journey now, all the really important treasures that I need for the journey. I've got the word of the Lord. I've got this lamp, and I've got really big sock monkey. Um, okay, hang on. Okay, what does it say here? Okay, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. You know what this means? It means I can get rid of the sock monkey. There we go. Oh, I tell you how hard it is to read the Bible when you're holding a really big sock monkey. All right, you know, so I've got everything I need for the journey now, all my treasures. I've got the word of the Lord, and I've got this. Hang on a second. Let's see, this says, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I get to hand off the lamp. Oh, I'm starting to feel lighter already, and all I'm left with is the one thing that has all of those things in it. It's the one thing that I really can't live without that I've needed the whole time. And that is the word of the Lord. But let's, let's see, just to be sure, if I've got the right thing left for my journey. This is Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them, and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust do not eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Take in a deep breath. (sighs) Repeat after me. Dear God, there's a big world. We got lots of stuff. We don't need all that stuff. We need our friends. We need our family. We need the word of the Lord. And we need you. And we've got all those things. Amen. Have a great day. See ya. I'll be collecting those later. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Worship the Lord, strength. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord, the, cedars of Lebanon. the Lord makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord, the, Lord fire. the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The, Lord shakes the, wilderness the voice of the Lord makes the oaks to whirl and strips the forests bare. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as ruler forever.
stand and we will affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Loving God, we are so thankful that you claim us as your beloved children. You call us to go into the world and share the good news of what it means to be in community with one another. Remind us how to be faithful to your call upon our lives. Help us be good to one another to offer a kind word to someone who desperately needs to hear it, food to those who are struggling with daily sustenance, a visit to someone who is lonely, comfort to those who are hurting, and an attentive ear to someone who is going through a difficult time. God, we are so grateful for the many blessings in our lives. For the rainfall that replenished your earth this week, for glimpses of peace in your world, for reconciliation when we've been estranged, for health following sickness, for rest after hard work, for dear friends and loving families, and for the good news that hope is stronger than despair, that love is stronger than hate, and life is stronger than death. We offer this prayer and the prayers of our innermost hearts this day as we pray the prayer your Son, Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
A reading from the, book, from the book of Romans. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. He did this so the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now the way we live is based on the spirit, not based on selfishness. People whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things. But people whose lives are based on the spirit think about things that are related to the spirit. The attitude comes from the selfishness leads to death, but the attitude that comes from the Spirit leads to life and peace. So the attitude that comes from the selfishness is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God. But you aren't self-centered. Instead, you are in the Spirit. In fact, God's Spirit lives in you. If anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to him. If Christ is in you, the Spirit is your life because of God's righteousness, but the body is dead because of sin. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also, through his Spirit that lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. But if you put to death the actions of the body with the spirit, you will live. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you were adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ, if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified by him. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. Please be seated. A man went to visit his cardiologist in a follow-up visit. In an earlier visit, he had been placed on new medications, and the cardiologist, of course, asked the question, How are you doing? How's everything? And he said, Well, I'm having trouble with one of the medications. Oh, he said, Which one? He said, The medical patches. Well, what's the problem? Well, the instructions said to put a new patch on every six hours. Yes, and you've done that? Yes, I have. The problem is 
I'm running out of places to put the patches. (laughs) Knowing what to throw away, knowing what to keep, it's important. Think about that reality show, Hoarders. It's It has put a spotlight on a really very serious problem, uh, an obsessive-compulsive disorder of hoarding where people are not able to throw away. They keep everything. That somehow everything becomes a part of who they are and to throw it away is to throw away a part of themselves. And so it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates And not throwing anything away then takes over everything. And pretty soon the house is unlivable. Relationships are broken up. Friendships are destroyed. People become isolated because they cannot throw away. Knowing what to throw away and what to keep is an important issue just in the everyday living of our lives just in the way we manage things, but even more so, much more so, in our spiritual lives. The Apostle Paul dealt with this a lot in his letters, and we're going to be looking at that this morning. But as a way to get into what Paul has to say, I want to bring to mind James Nelson's work on sin. James Nelson was one of our lecturers about six years ago in October. Of, it would be six years ago this coming October. He was here right after his book Thirst came out. And he was sharing from his own experience what he understands from his experience, from his life, and from his understanding as a theologian and biblical scholar, what the basis of sin is. What, under, what is the sin that under, is underneath the sins? The Apostle Paul has, in various places in his letters, these catalogs of specific sins. That is, those things that separate us from God, separate us from one another. But what James Nelson is talking about is sin in the singular what is underneath it all, and what the aspects of that are for him. And he names four. And the first is perfectionism. Perfectionism. Now this, of course, does not mean perfection in the sense of John Wesley's Christian perfection. That biblical word perfect really means whole, complete, mature. And so when Jesus says that we must be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, John Wesley helped us to understand that what he is saying is perfect in love. That is whole, complete, mature. Those are meanings of the Greek word that's usually translated perfect. And those are better translations, really. The word perfect scares us to death. And in fact, that word perfect can lead us into this perfectionism. Perfectionism is quite different. Perfectionism is this drivenness to be perfect in all ways. This drivenness to be completely without sin. This drivenness to be perfect in every way so that we earn the love and the respect and even the admiration of other people. And it leeches over into our relationship with God so that we soon begin to believe that we must earn the love and of of God and grace goes out the window and what happens is our own self-esteem goes way down and our anxiety goes way up and when we follow that path of perfectionism what happens is we begin to be envious we begin to be hypercritical and judgmental we begin to feel hopeless we begin to despair from perfectionism And James Nelson says that really is one of the aspects that is underneath what manifests itself as sin. Perfectionism. The second one is control. Control. This is the desire to control everything and to control everyone. It is the desire to be in charge. 
an old uh, revivalist said, who told you that God went on vacation and put you in charge? Sometimes we act in that way. We want to control everything. We want to, we want to be in charge of it all. We want to manage everything. And of course we can't do it. And when we try to do it, we are trying to play God. And we always fail. And so there's perfectionism. There is control. And then there's selfishness or self-centeredness. Now this is the word that Paul uses in our text for today. Um, I asked Tammy to read the text from the Common English Bible because it's normally translated flesh. Now Paul uses that word flesh in a lot of different ways in different contexts in his letter. But here he means selfish desires, selfishness, self-centeredness. And so it's translated that way in the Common English Bible. And it's a good translation. It helps us understand that it's much broader than what we may think of when we think of the flesh. This is self-centeredness. It's selfishness. It's putting ourselves at the center of our world, the center of our universe. And it's one of those things that under, is, is underneath the sin that manifests itself in our lives. And then finally, there's attachment. Attachment. This is the inability to let go. It is grasping, clinging to things, clinging to places, clinging to people, clinging to ideas, clinging to whatever it is that we have set up in our lives as really God. What are we most concerned about? What do we think about? What do we meditate on? What do we organize our lives around, plan our lives around? What are we attached to? It is the question, Nelson says, of idolatry. What has become God for us is that to which we have attached ourselves. Paul Tillich defined faith as the state of being ultimately concerned and what he means by that is whatever we're ultimately concerned about, whatever, our, whatever we think about all the time, whatever we plan around all the time, that thing has become like a God for us. And we have fallen into idolatry. That's attachment. And it's hard to let go. And yet letting go is so important. When Paul speaks of this throughout his letters... And in our text for today, Paul talks about dying and being raised with Christ. So radical is this notion of letting go that it's like letting go of life. It is throwing away the old life in order to be raised to new life in Christ. Paul says to live in Christ is to die with Christ and to be raised with Christ. Jesus put it this way. Whoever would save his or her life must lose it. Jesus even said, and this is a startling metaphor, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, Jesus says, pluck it out and throw, I mean, cut it off and throw it away. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't mean that we are to mutilate ourselves. But what Jesus is saying is, what is it in our lives that we must throw away? And implied in that is, what must we keep? What must we throw away in order to really have life and have it abundant? And what must we keep? The Apostle Paul wrestled with this in his own life. I want to read a text from Paul for you. It's from Philippians. And Paul is recounting how he had to throw away many things that were critically important to him. As I think about these things for Paul, I can see in them perfectionism. And I can see in them control. I can see in them selfishness, self-centeredness. I can see in them attachment. And I want you to hear Paul's words and see if you can see that as well. Listen to what he says. 
If anyone else has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I am a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to the faith, I harassed the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I am blameless. These were my assets. But I wrote them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. But even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I've lost everything for Him. But what I lost, I think of as sewer trash, so that I might gain Christ and be found in Him. In Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith. The righteousness that I have comes from knowing Christ, the power of His resurrection, and the participation in His sufferings. It includes being conformed to His death so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I've already reached this goal or I've already been perfected, but I pursue it so that I may grab hold of it because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think that I've reached it. But I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and I reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. Do you hear in Paul's words this struggle to let go of that which he had built his life around so that he could attain real life, abundant life, so that he could actually receive all that he was looking for before as he held on to those other things. And letting go is difficult. How do we do that? I mean, it's one thing to think about what we need to throw away in our lives. It's another thing to do it. It is as though we are like those who suffer from that OCD condition of of hoarding. They've become a part of us, these things, these aspects that manifest themselves in our lives in ways that separate us from others and separate us from God. What are we to do with these things? How are we to throw these things away when they have become a part of who we are? It's so difficult. Paul wrestled with that as well. In the previous chapter to this one, our our text is in today. In the seventh chapter, Paul says, I I know what's right and I can't do it. And, And the thing that I know I should not do, that's the thing I do. And I I know what the law requires, and I cannot seem to do that. I know what it prohibits, and I can't seem to keep from doing that. The very thing that I ought not do is the thing I do. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You hear the, the desperation in that? The helplessness in that? And then he says... Thanks be to God who give in Christ in Christ Jesus our Lord. In our text for today, he says we are set free in Christ. Living in Christ is what enables us to let go. Because by ourselves, it's just so difficult to do. You all know, many of you know, that I'm very interested in aviation. And I was reading recently about ejection seats in the early jet fighters. The pilots were used to flying at much slower speeds. And so what would happen when a pilot had to eject from the aircraft, of course the ejection seat would fly out of the plane, rocket out of the plane, out of the jet. And the pilot had to push himself off of the off the seat in order for the parachute on his back to be able to deploy 
But what they found in too many cases is the pilot could not let go of the seat. It was the vest, it was the one thing that had been his source of security. It was the last vestige of the aircraft that had been his safe place hurtling through the air. And so he just couldn't let go. He just couldn't. He was frozen, stuck to it. So they went back to the drawing board and they devised an apparatus that used a web strap that had a take-up reel on it. Two seconds after ejection, this take-up reel would take up the slack on the strap and it would force the pilot out of the ejection seat. One pilot described it as a spring-loaded whoopee cushion. (laughs) Forced him out of the seat. Why was it necessary? Because he just couldn't let go. Letting go is hard. Paul says we just can't let go by ourselves. But in Christ, we can. In Christ, we are enabled to do that. In Christ, we have the strength, walking in the Spirit, as Paul so often calls it, to be able to let go of those things that we believe have become a part of us, but not really. They need to be thrown away. Paul threw a lot of things away in his life, and he talks about those. But he kept some things too. He talks about when you walk in the Spirit, when you live in Christ, your life bears the fruit of the Spirit. Those are things to keep. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, so forth. And then Paul at the end of his life, wrote to Timothy and said, the time of my departure has come. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Kept it. What does that mean? Keeping that trust in God. Keeping God in that place, that central place in his life. That's what he kept. Fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. That's a powerful statement. I hope to be able to say that with my own life, my own words that I've thrown away many things, but I've kept the faith. We started our service with that wonderful hymn that describes the paradox of living life in Christ. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. So I want to close with this little parable. It's the parable of the kite. The parable of the kite. Kite is flying high, loves to fly, loves to soar. Loves to dip and whirl in the wind. And the kite begins to think, you know, if I weren't tethered to that person down there, then I would be free. I'd be really free. If I just wasn't weren't tethered in that way. And then one day the string broke. The kite was apparently free. But of course it didn't soar anymore. It whirled and fell like a leaf in autumn and lodged in a tree, caught. The owner of the kite climbed up, retrieved the kite, repaired the string, and pretty soon it was flying again. And it realized the key to freedom It's to be tethered in the right way, to be tied in the right way. That's the good news of our faith. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I will be free. Captivate me, O God, in your loving arms, and then I will be free. Amen.
Accept these gifts, gracious God, from hearts that love and hearts that trust, that these gifts will be used to bless your children. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to invite, uh, do you want to invite the uh, mission folks? Yeah, that would be fine. We have a couple of mission teams, I believe the youth. Are there any of the youth coming, to Casey? Okay. The youth are coming down uh, for share about their youth mission trips, and our Costa Rica team is here. They'll be coming forward to the hymn of invitation. Uh, we're going again, 20 of us, to Puerto Viejo, uh, Costa Rica, to work on a medical clinic once again. And Casey will share a little bit in a moment about the youth as we conclude our invitational hymn. And to you who would join our church today, we invite you to come forward as well as we sing our hymn of invitation.
to first mention that uh, at the earlier service today, a family joined at our Children First service, the Yarbrough family, Micah, Christiana, and their son, Brendan. And we have uh, at this service new members who come, uh, Sandra Lester and her son, Jalen. And I want to mention Hunter. Um, Hunter is the one who invited Jay in the first place, and Jay came and found all these other young people and the great spirit in this church, and he wanted to become a part of our church family. So he brought his mom, and here they are. And Hunter, we're grateful you're our newest missionary, and we appreciate you. Thank you. As you become part of this congregation, I uh, ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Welcome to you all. You. Yeah, welcome to you. And I'm going to ask you to remain down front, and folks will have a chance to, to greet you in just a moment and welcome you. We, uh, and Michael Dixon is standing up here. He's part of our First Friends program, and he, you'll get acquainted with, with him. We want to have prayer for these folks who are about to go and represent our church in various mission trips. And I'm going to ask uh, Casey to say a word about the youth mission trips, uh, including uh, the, the youth choir, which will be headed out uh, to Colorado, right, next week. And so the youth choir is staying up there because they still have work to do. But we're praying for you as well. Here you go, Casey. There's also a crossover, and some of the youth choir members will also be on our mission trips this summer. We have a total of, I think, about 60 people, that will adults and youth, that will be going out on two different trips. The middle school is going to Austin, Texas, and we'll be working with a the community there doing some gardening um, for... Uh, a low-income kind of community and doing some work with some local schools on some small construction projects. And then the high school is heading to Joplin, Missouri to do a lot of debris removal and uh, some tornado relief up there. So. Thank you. Chuck, you want to say more about Costa Rica? No, this will be our seventh year going to Costa Rica. We've helped build a large sanctuary there over those seven years. Some of the team members with us have gone all seven years. About half our team are new members coming and joining us as well this year, and we'll be working on the extended medical clinic again to offer people medical care that they would not otherwise receive, those who are very impoverished in the plantation areas around the church. So that's our mission, and also enjoy the rainforest and, and uh, see the beauty of uh, Costa Rica as well. Thank you, Chuck. Mm -hmm. And let me ask for your prayers as well for the members of our congregation, clergy and congregation members who are members of the Central Texas Annual Conference. It begins this evening in Waco and will go through Wednesday afternoon. And so we ask for your prayers for the Central Texas Annual Conference as well. Let's all bow in prayer as we pray together. Oh God, we thank you for all your gifts, the gifts that we see represented in each one standing before us. And th these persons who so generously use their gifts in ministry and mission to many different people, and they do it in your name. We pray your blessing upon them as they go from this place. May they go in the sure knowledge that they go not alone, but in your presence, and they go with our prayers and our love. Guide them in their work and bring them home safely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. I see trees.